Dustin Wax once said, the screen is only part of the presentation and not the most important part. I want you to keep that in mind today as we work on effective PowerPoint presentations, or maybe it would be better to say as we look at some ineffective ways to make PowerPoint presentations. When we concentrate on the message that we are trying to convey to our audience, then PowerPoint becomes a way to enhance that message and to help people understand it more. When we let PowerPoint distract us from the message, then it becomes worse for the presentation, worse for you, and worse for your audience. So I want us to keep in mind what an effective PowerPoint presentation does and what some of the tips are to avoid making ineffective presentations. That's the focus of today's flip video, and now we're going to have Don McMillan set some context for us. Well, what I tell people all the time, this is how we communicate in today's world. Okay? This is what we don't want. This is typically called life or death by PowerPoint, right? We've all, I, we think in PowerPoint now. I was actually, I, this is a true story. I was in, uh, driving through Colorado a couple years ago. I hit a patch of ice on I-70 coming out of the Eisenhower Tunnel going like, you know, 65, 70, maybe 90 miles an hour. And I started spinning at top speed and my life flashed before my eyes and I swear to you it was in PowerPoint. <laughs> So this is a thing I, got, I do called Life After Death by PowerPoint. Basically, don't do these things with PowerPoint. These are the things that people do that drive me nuts. And the only way to show them not to do this is to show them what not to do. So the, the biggest one I see, the most common PowerPoint thing, number one, people tend to put every word they're going to say on their PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Although this eliminates the need to memorize your talk, ultimately it makes your slides crowded, wordy, and boring. You lose your audience's attention before you even reach the bottom of your first slide. <laughs> Second most common, uh, font size is important. Size matters. Too small, and that's not, that's not good for anybody. On the other hand, too big, and you're looking more. You just look like an idiot. Uh, don't have your fonts moving. Keep your text stationary. There's nothing more annoying than text that does it. Blinking, don't have it blinking. Don't have it spinning. Don't have stuff flying around the screen. You drive people with ADD crazy, they're just like, oh, what's happening? Oh. The font you choose, be very careful. Everybody has their, their favorite font. The font you choose sends a message about who you are as a person. There's a long list of fonts. We pick one. That reflects our personality. We're sending an unspoken message. So, for example, if you choose Carrier New, it means you're organized and structured. And like to pretend you're still using a typewriter. <laughs> if you choose Comic Sans, it means you think you're funny. And if you choose Times New Roman, it means you're lazy, apathetic, and unimaginative, and you always use the default. Now, uh, if you type in all small letters, some people do that, all small letters, that means you're qui, shy, and unassertive. If you type in all capital letters, that means uh, you yell a lot. There's somebody over there. If you type a uh, small letter followed by capital letters, it means uh, your cap flock is stock on. Don't you hate when that happens? Usually going along for a while, you look up, oh, darn! And then finally, if you have a mix of capital letters and small letters, that means uh, this is a ransom note and you are a kidnapper. <laughs> Very hard to do, by the way. Uh, it's the fourth most common power for me is like, avoid excessive bullet pointing, only bullet key points. Too many bullet points and your key messages will not stand out. In fact, the term bullet point comes from people firing guns at annoying presenters. <laughs> This slide, by the way, has crashed PowerPoint. Apparently, there's, there's a max about how many bullet points you can have, and I, I said, I pressed it. The other thing you can do is have animations. People love animations. They have stuff going, zooming in and out and left and right. You get seasick watching some of these. And it turns out if you're a visual learner, your effectiveness as a speaker will go up with the more animations. But if they're easily distracted, they are not even paying attention to what you're saying. They're just watching the cool stuff. And there's regions to this graph. There's the simple but effective region, the active but confusing, the uh, effective but boring, the uh, active but ineffective, the dull but static region, the uh, busy but useless region over there, the ADD only region there up in the corner, <laughs> the useful amusing, the stupid confusing, the dull triangle, the hyper triangle, the uh, sleepy square, the dizzying pentagon, and then everything else is just grouped into what's called pointless motion. <laughs> This one slide, by the way, took me three and a half weeks to make. <laughs> it's true. It's all, PowerPoint can suck the life out of you. 
Now, come kind of my final point, uh, and this people do all the time, is they'll just have graph after graph just to impress you with their, with their graph prowess. And uh, I chose uh, acronym usage. This is my real-time acronym usage. It pretty much goes up and down. I don't know why you'd need the graph, but you can see pretty much peak there. I'll use some more acronyms later. And uh, there's just a chart that doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense to you, but I, I just want to impress you. Here's a, uh, an acronym, letter distribution. C's, I's, E's, N's, and S's are the most common letters that I use in my acronyms. Here's a uh, uh, pie chart uh, letter distribution. That's an, and here's, I have no idea what you'd use that for, but you can generate that automatically in PowerPoint. Uh, so I figured what the heck I did. Oh. Uh, back to the charts again. Here's a pie chart of uh, chart types, 3D charts, uh, bar charts, pie charts. Here's a uh, pie chart of ch pies for dessert, lemon, pumpkin, cherry, pecan, apple. Here's a uh, pizza pie chart. Uh, here's your pot pie chart. Here's a pie chart with values of pi for the nerds out there. Yeah, 3.14159, 22.7, 3.14, and uh, pie itself. Uh, here's a, we have a pie chart, I was thinking, why don't we have a, a cake chart? So there's a cake chart. <laughs> why don't we leave the cake out? There's a, a birthday cake chart. There's a wedding cake chart. Uh, there's a bunt cake chart. Uh, an upside down cake chart. And then, really, that's an upside down cake chart. And, uh, all right, I think I've covered all the charts. Any questions at this point? So what I want to start with is this idea of a learning process. The, the learning process that you've been doing for the last five days about the history of computers and the history of the internet is separate from the, the process of the demonstration. You've heard me say so far that you shouldn't start working on your presentation while you're doing the research. That's because the research is one piece of the entire learning process. It's you gathering data and gathering facts. When you get to the learning, that's you taking that data, taking the facts, taking the information that you have in your brain already and melding them together. That's what learning is, is creating new ideas and new information based on your context and the new data that you have. When you've done all of that, when you have an understanding of all of that, then it's time to demonstrate your knowledge, whether you're demonstrating it for a teacher on a test or demonstrating it for an audience in a presentation. But if you don't already understand what it is you're talking about, then the demonstration is probably not going to be that strong. You shouldn't be working on the demonstration until you have an understanding of what it is you're presenting. That being said, you've done the research. You've gotten the idea of what we're talking about. It's time to create your demonstration, and we want it to be as effective as possible. So a couple of things are going to review what Don McMillan went over in his presentation, and a couple of things might be new. So make sure that your notes cover these. As you look at this, what is wrong with this slide? If you identified something is wrong with the background, then you're right on target. One of the things that we're going to be concentrating on, or one of the things I'm going to be looking for in your presentation, is for you to create an effective contrast on your slides. And the busier your background is, or the more varied your background is, the harder it is to create an effective slide. Because as you look here, the slide, the word slide, is very high contrast. I can read that easily. In fact, it almost looks three-dimensional the way it pops out of the screen. But as you get up to the top, it becomes harder and harder to read. In fact, if I turn on one of the highlighters that we use, you can see that up here, the red has high contrast. But as we bring it down, it becomes harder and harder to read until it becomes almost invisible in this area. That's the type of thing that you want to avoid when you're creating your presentation. Don't make your work harder for you by using ineffective backgrounds just because they're pretty. And this is not just limited to color. If you look at each of those individual squares in the background on that pattern, over half of the background of this pattern is the exact same color as the text. So it's no wonder that you can't read it. Let's talk a little bit more about fonts. I know that he's already covered some of it. Ultimately, what I want the two things that I want you to understand are one, be consistent in your font styles. The the human brain is wired to understand that fonts are, are conveyors of messages. And so when you use a bunch of different fonts on a single slide, the brain is trying to figure out what the different level or the different information is that's being carried in each individual font. Most of the time, it's not carrying a different message, and so it becomes very, very difficult for the human brain to keep focused on your message because it's too busy trying to figure out why you're distracting it with a lot of fonts. Tips that come off of some of your fonts. That would be these little pieces here, or on this A, this little corner piece and this piece here. These are called serifs. 
serif fonts are really good for titles. They're really good for making things look fancy or for emphasizing. So your titles and subtitles typically make make um, serif fonts will make those things stand out. However, if most of your slide is going to be text, if you're doing like a bullet point slide, serifs actually make it harder to read. And so you need to understand the difference and look for a sans serif font in order to um, communicate your basic ideas or your bullet point ideas more effectively. So serif titles with one font up at the top and then the information that you're conveying in bullet points using a sans serif font is usually the best way to go. You'll notice that I didn't speak while the information was coming up. It's very hard not to speak during that, but the only reason to use a fancy animation is because you want people to focus on the animation. So you should never be speaking when really fancy things are happening on the screen. The question, and it's an important question to ask yourselves, is it important for this animation to be on the screen. If the animation doesn't serve a purpose, do not use it. If it does serve a purpose, make sure everybody's attention is focused on it. Clip art. I dread clip art. Clip art is an interesting concept because it, it, it adds emphasis to what you're saying, and so it's supposed to be more effective. But typically what ends up happening is the clip art itself, especially animated clip art, doesn't add to your presentation. It doesn't add to your message. In fact, it's very seldom related to your message. And so generally avoid clip art. But if you are going to use clip art, make sure that the clip art is very specific to your message and actually adds to your message. If it doesn't, find some other way to communicate it. I can find absolutely no reason why you could, should ever need to have the typewriter font. It's the most annoying font and animation ever created. Okay, let's talk a little bit about organizing your, your presentation as a whole and how many slides you need to choose. Your message, your presentation is one main idea. Um, you want to talk about the fact that computers have gotten smaller over time, or you want to talk about the fact that mobile is the way of the future. You need some proof of that information, and so you might use one, two, or even three basic proof points to show that what you're claiming is true. Each one of those would be a slide. In fact, you might have a slide for each point under your subtopic. Maybe you want to divide it into cell phones and tablets, or maybe you want to divide your entire presentation into decades, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And you want to talk about a couple of things in each one of those decades. Not a problem. Where we run into problems is when you try to fit either too much information onto a single slide or when you try to fit too many slides into an overall presentation. Ultimately, you have to ask yourselves, what, how much information can I give about my topic that one, proves my point, and that two, fits into the time limitation of my assignment. Too much information is never a good thing because it distracts the audience and makes them unable to comprehend your overall message. This is an actual slide that was used in a Pentagon presentation. What is the main idea from this presentation? No clue? Yeah, I don't have any either. This is a ridiculous slide. This is not a slide that should ever be used in a presentation. It was a bad idea for the Pentagon. It's a bad idea for you. So a couple of things to finish up. Keep these things in mind. Your presentation 
should be consistent. That means consistent backgrounds, consistent fonts, consistent placement. If you're going to use the titles at the top of your slide, every title for every slide should be at the top. If you're going to use bullet point fonts on the right hand side and pictures on the left hand side, do that with every slide. Mixing it up while it makes you feel like you're being more creative is just distracting the audience from the message because they're used to the pattern that you started with. Keep your messages simple. Keep everything focused on the main idea. Your main idea is the focus and goal of your entire presentation. Every sub point, every picture, every bullet point should lead toward the person going, yes, I agree with the main idea. Take advantage of what PowerPoint does best. PowerPoint is best because it uses pictures, because it uses audio, because it uses video. That multimedia that can't be presented in any other way effectively in a live presentation, PowerPoint gives you the ability to do it. If all you have is a line of text on bullet points, you could have done that with poster board. So take advantage of the media that you're using. Most of your bullet points should be a single line, and you should generally follow the rule of five or six. No more than five or six bullet points on a slide, and they should be about a single line each. If you get anything more than that or you get overly complicated, you need to consider breaking the slide up into two pieces. Finally, check your grammar and punctuation. If you're misusing grammar, if you're not writing with verbs, if you are misusing punctuation, that can distract the audience, especially with misspellings. You don't necessarily have to have complete sentences for every bullet point unless your teacher tells you to, but you should be consistent. Notice this slide. I don't have any complete sentences, but I'm consistent in not having complete sentences. You don't have to, as long as you're consistent, you don't have to worry about being one way or the other. Some final pieces on your presentation and how you interact with your slide. Don't say every word on the slide. Don't parrot your PowerPoint. There's a phenomenon called slide rush. Slide rush you've seen when you've been watching a teacher present and then they realize that they're going to run out of time so they have too many slides and so they either start skipping slides which means they fly through about five or six slides where they get to the end and tell you about all of the slides that they were going to tell you about but they ran out of time. You should be timing out your presentation so that you have the appropriate number of slides and not have to skip through slide rush. Always talk to your audience, not to your slides. You should have your system set up in a way that you know what you're going to be saying and what slide is on the screen. You should not have to rely on the words on the slide in order to speak to your audience. Don't apologize. You're going to make mistakes. Everybody does. But if the only thing they remember from your presentation was the number of times you said, I'm sorry this didn't work, then your presentation becomes less, less effective. Leave time for questions. If you're giving a 15 minute presentation, your presentation should probably only be 10 or 11 minutes long, and you should have four minutes for presentations, you should, or for questions. You need to be able to answer questions, and that shows that you, can, that you really know your material, and that you're not just reading something that you didn't actually understand. Finally, in our culture, we have this tendency to believe that off the cuff is better, that impromptu is superior to all other forms of speaking. I like impromptu speaking as much as the next person, but that's just not true. Your initial adrenaline rush of the first time you present it can be effective, but after that you've got to practice. And so you are much better off if you care about your grade, if you care about the message, if you care about the presentation, to practice and make sure it works. Going over it a couple of times in your head, in front of a mirror, in front of a TV, helps your presentation be more effective and it lets your message be understood better by your audience. Finally, on a PowerPoint, always include your resources. Whether you put the resources on the slide or you save them toward the end, you should always be um, giving credit where credit is due. It's important for all of our presentations, for all of our papers, to give credit to the places where we got our information from. 
And that about wraps up today's flip video. Remember, these tips for ineffective presentations, they apply not just to PowerPoint, but to Keynote, to Google Docs, to anything you're using as a presentation medium. Remember that you want to focus on your message and using these presentation tools to extend and emphasize your message, not to distract your audience from the main idea. Keep focused on that. Your presentations will be effective and your grades will reflect it. Have a great evening.